you can still hear me, right? No, can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So, oh well, too bad you can't see me. All right. So Debbie told me there that the link I tried to put in the um, on the website to the Google Doc didn't work. So I'm going to put it in the chat as well. Tell me if that one works. It did work for me. Oh, okay. okay. When did you go for it? Um, about two and a half hours ago. Oh, okay. Because I did, I couldn't get it to. I, it, it wouldn't react for me. Just depends on your karma. <laughs> I, I agree. This serious. Um. So, Wikipedia. The Wikipedia page for um, Jewish Apocrypha lists one, like, I don't know, I'm not even gonna count them, like 30 books of Apocrypha. By contrast, uh, Safaria gives the text in English for about 10, 15. Um, and the book that I'm reading, um, called the Jewish Annotated Apocrypha has somewhere in between, has 20, maybe 25. They do state the, um, the authors or editors of the, the book that I'm reading do state that they purposely left out the book of Enoch because Enoch and Jubilees are the two longest and there was no way to publish a book that contains both of them without it like being ridiculously unwieldy. And they made the decision to include Jubilees instead because it has more unique material. Whereas Enoch is a um, very apocalyptic text that also contains a lot of the same kind of, um, it's like, a, it, I don't know, it contains a lot of similar material as like the Esdras. Um, so they decided, even though it's a different, main character, but the themes are similar enough that they decided to not include that. But then there are some others um, on this list from Wikipedia that included um, other things that are not on either um, in, in this Jewish annotated apocrypha scholarly book, nor um, have been translated yet on um, Safaria. And so, um, I did my best to summarize and include links where they could be found um, to where you can read the text. The only one I couldn't find any source for is the vision of Amram, um, which is a deathbed li um, literature, which is like a, a, a class of literature similar to what we see in the Bible with like Isaac and Jacob um, on their deathbeds giving their final blessings to their children. So a lot of the um, Apocrypha then are just more of that, that, that like ver versions of that we don't see in the text necessarily um, in the Bible. Later authors ascribed them to, excuse me, um, to Amram, who is the father of Moses, to Amram's father, Kohat, um, to Moses, which is interesting because Moses doesn't really have a deathbed scene because he goes up to the mountain to die by himself. So the Testament of Moses is a little different than the others, but it's similar. Um, there's one for Abraham. There's one for each of the 12 sons of Jacob. Um, so that's a whole class genre of apocrypha in a, of itself. Um, and, and so, yeah, so the one of Amram, Moses' father, was the only source I could not, or the only text I could not find any source for, um, which is too bad because it sounds really interesting. <laughs> um, and a lot of the ones that I could find sources for that weren't on Safaria are from like sort of dubious Christian websites. 
So just as a disclaimer, not dubious in that, I don't think any of them are gonna give you scam, uh, viruses or anything, but just that their translations might be altered. And um, one of the themes particularly altered because one of the themes I saw again and again in the summaries that I was compiling of some of these um, texts is that um, not a lot of, not like the majority of these, you know, 30, 40 books that are listed on the Wikipedia page, but like a good handful, like maybe five or six of them. Um, the only extant copies that have been found have clear Christian editing, like that there are pieces of it that show traces that are like, have a more core Jewish, more ancient um, beginning, but then all of the manuscripts that have been found have like, prologues and epilogues and whatever that were clearly added a hundred years later by early Christians. Um, so obviously if you go, I can't remember exactly how it all matched up, the which websites I found for which text, but if you were to go to a Christian website to read those apocrypha, you will find the Christian versions of them and not the scrolls from Qumran. Um, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, you know, just as a disclaimer. Um, because there's so many, I don't even totally know where to start, but I guess um, I'll just give a little bit more background. And then if you, any of those stand out to you, or if you had the chance to look at the doc, then we can talk a little bit more about some in particular. So the way the document is set up is first I just copy and pasted the list from Wiki, like the Wikipedia page on Jewish Apocrypha gives this list. And so I copy and pasted that. So it's order is from Wikipedia in the Torah, in the prophets, in the writing, and then ex extra, which is there's other Apocrypha you might call inter um, testamental, but since we don't care about the second testament, <laughs> It, we don't, there's no such idea as intertestamental for Jewish writings, but yeah, Debbie. Did you say uh, some of the things on the list are from the Torah? Well, in, in terms of, they are Refer references, right, that they are okay. retellings of Torah. Okay. Like, that's how this is listed. Is, so okay, says, gotcha. The heading says in the Torah, it doesn't mean that these writings are found in any Masoretic okay. version of the five books of Moses, but that they're about, they're retellings of Genesis or Moses or, um, you know, that sort of thing. Okay. And the same thing too, then with, um, with the ones from prophets and Nevi'im, like, so for example, the first one that is on my list, Oh, this is another one I couldn't find copies of. Another, the next one, the first one on my list in the Nivi'im category, the book of Gad the seer. Gad is mentioned um, briefly in Kings and no, in Samuel and a little bit more so in Chronicles um, as a prophet to, uh, to King David. He has a fairly brief like he does not get as much airtime as Nathan um and so for whatever reason he wasn't popular his book is not recorded but there are other references and other ma ancient manuscripts that he did have a full prophetic book like Nathan didn't have his own prophetic book in the bible either but whatever like uh Habakkuk or that it's not as long as Jeremiah or Isaiah but you know like the 12 prophets we know um but no extant Hebrew copies of that book have been found so we're not entirely sure about it but there are other Hebrew or not Hebrew Aramaic Greek like other ancient manuscripts that reference having that book so He's in the prophets, he is a prophet, so it's in that section, but his book is not included in the books of the prophets, if that makes sense for this ordering. Um, 
So that's the ordering in on the Google Doc and according to, again, because the Wikipedia page, I think also that's where I had that table I showed you last time that um, kind of lays out who canonized what. Um, meanwhile, my book, um, the Jewish Annotated Apocrypha has it more separated by themes. So the Book of Jubilees is a book of law, even though it's largely a retelling from starting with creation, but because its focus is so much on these cycles of years and like backdating um, commandments of holidays to earlier origins in Genesis, it's considered a book of law. Then we've got histories and stories, which, can, which includes first Esdras, um, the expanded Greek Esther, uh, the book of Tobit, the book of Judith, uh, and, the, and three books of Maccabees. There is a fourth book of Maccabees, but it is very corrupted by the Christian influence. Um, oh wait, no, sorry, I have it the other way around. It is not corrupted by the Christian influence, it's corrupted by the Hellenistic influence, ironically. Um, so that's histories and stories. Then we've got a category of prophecies, which includes the additions to Daniel um, and the additions of Jeremiah. So there's a letter of Jeremiah and um, a book of Baruch, who is Jeremiah's scribe, um, mentioned in the book of Jeremiah in the, um, in the Tanakh. He gets his own book that posits he was a prophet in his own right in the, um, in the Apocrypha. And then there's a section on poetry and wisdom, which includes um, some Psalms that were found after the fact. Uh, the Wisdom of Solomon, which is similar to Proverbs, and Ben Sira, or Sirach, which is similar, also similar to Proverbs in composition, but it's attributed to Ben Sira, not to Solomon. So those are the categories and some examples of the books. Does anybody have like a question or a starting point that they where where to delve in um is is the the book of ben sira the one that if you remember um mario got all excited about hearing something during torah study and yes and my question would be why what what was special about that for him if you have any idea and and because i i had never heard of it before not that um, i'm a I don't know. I mean, it's a work of ethics similar to Proverbs. It's slightly more narrative, which maybe makes it more engaging to read. Um, and so I think he just enjoys the wisdom in it. Like, I think he just, uh, I know he, he has some particular quotes he feels very drawn to from it, um, but I'm not sure exactly what his background with it is. Um, it's also known as Ecclesiasticus, and so sometimes he gets Ecclesiastes and Ecclesiasticus. A lot of people get them confused, but that's come up in conversation with us before that he goes looking in the book of Ecclesiastes for a particular quote. And it's not there because it's from Ben Sira. Um, so it is also where the earliest known written midrash of Lilith comes from, or is not, not comes from, but is recorded. Scholars are pretty sure that midrash precedes him. But th that's another thing though, actually, speaking of midrash that I was surprised by um, in looking into some of these is how many are written like midrash. Like there seems to be, even though they have a different classification, and they are older than Midrash and slightly more contemporary with other, with the books that did get canonized. Some of them like Jubilees feels like it's a 
you know, we, this word we learned last week, pluriform, like it's another version of Torah that was trying, that was like vying for its place in the canon. But a lot of them feel like maybe they were kind of self-aware that they were distinct, that they were interpretations of older oral versions of the story. Like there are distinct, um, storytelling tools utilized in some of these um, that are more indicative of Midrash and like folklore than how our Torah reads. Although as I started to say that, I thought maybe it's the other way around that our Torah was then pared down to look more historical that like the terse language would somehow feel more serious. So I guess we don't really know which came first because all of it was oral first. But I still have in my mind that biblical authority piece that the version that we've been taught is canon must be more authentic somehow. So these other versions that expand and are written more like what we consider folklore must clearly be intentional expansions. But I, we don't really know, I guess. It, I know nothing, but it just kind of makes sense that handing things, uh, stories, information from person to person, generation through generation, that you would have more of a storytelling. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, you're sitting around the fire, right? Like this is this is their only means of entertainment in a lot of ways. And yeah. their, their way of historical record keeping. So the more interesting it is, the better it's going to get passed down. The, the more people are, the next generation is gonna remember it. It's like a grandfather or maybe great grandfather now talking about his experiences in, in war to right. the grandchildren. And again, I don't know anything, but I would just make sense that it would be in more of a storytelling conversational style. But yeah. You pick one of those to start us off with? Sure. Well, let's go with um, let's go with Judith because I think there's some familiarity with the story, right? What do you know about Judith? She cut somebody's head off after getting him drunk. Because... That is accurate. <laughs> nice, Leah. Let's start there. So, Judith. Um, cut somebody's head off after getting him drunk. So she's sort of, it, it, in some ways, sort of similar to... Um, Lorena. Lorena? I don't know what that is. She's not know. from Prince William. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, 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 that one. Okay. That one, sorry, yes. Um, I was going to say Yael from the Tanakh, from Judges, but also, sure, maybe. She, she lures him in. She, uh, well, yeah, Elle doesn't lure him in the same way. He goes into her tent and she's like, ah, there's a guy at my tent. But anyway, she, there's like a using of her feminine wiles and being soothing and being um, a good hostess, but using that to then also put him off his guard. Um, and then she cuts his head off. And she feeds him cheese to make him thirsty, to make yes. him drink wine. And that's why we eat cheese for Shavuot? For I can't remember. For Hanukkah. For Hanukkah, yeah. Yeah, so this story is often told with Hanukkah. Um, although, so I thought, also the, the general's name that she cuts off is Holofernes, which sounds... Greek to me. So I thought like, yeah, this is a Hanukkah story. 
Turns out, actually, in looking at the text itself, it's about the Assyrian uh, and um, Babylonian conquest. Holofernes is a general of Nebuchadnezzar. So it takes place actually way before Hanukkah. Um, but because, A, because it was written during the Hasmonean period, um, and I guess because the themes are similar enough, like invading army, we win, whatever, um, that that's how it came to be read with Hanukkah or as a Hanukkah story. And then also um, the, the cheese thing became a tradition for Jews to eat dairy on Hanukkah, which I, don't, I mean, it's much more minor than eating uh, fried foods on Hanukkah. So I don't know how, like, how strong that connection is. Maybe it used to be stronger, but uh, it's a habit that died out a little bit with the, you know, like, because Judith has kind of faded into the background. Like, meanwhile, Maccabees is also not in the canon, but I feel like more people know the story of the Maccabees than the story of Judah. Um, and I mean, Judith is a like intimately violent story because you know she cuts off his head, like that's so close. Um, you know, like you have to really be up close and personal to like get someone drunk and like cut off their head. But it's not like Maccabees <laughs> is without, like it's a full on war probably people got decapitated. It's just not detailed as clearly. Um, so I, I'm not really sure. I mean, I have some guesses, but I'm not really sure why Maccabees um, takes this higher place of prominence. And then first Maccabees um, focuses on the military conquest and not the miracle of the oil. So that too is probably a later introduction that, you know, with the shift away from the military conquest to focusing on the miracle of the oil because of other, um, you know, that that was political that happened in the Mishnaic era, that maybe that explains the shift from dairy to fried foods. But anyway, um, those are, these are all sort of interconnected um, works of Apocrypha. Um, I also was surprised to learn that the other Maccabees, that fir first Maccabees is the only one that doesn't mention God. Um, it's something that like, I feel like I learned about that the original story of Hanukkah was so much more about the military might and not about divine intervention and all of this, but second um, and fourth Maccabees does actually include, it still focuses more on the military might. The thing about the oil is not in those stories, but it does mention God as like the source of their military success. Um, uh, as I said, I do think it's kind of ironic that second and third, no, second and fourth Maccabees were written only in Greek and for a Hellenistic Jewish um, community, but still focusing on the importance of following God and maintaining Judaism. Um, third Maccabees, meanwhile, sharp shift, not about the Maccabees or the Hasmoneans at all. Um, it's about a pharaoh named Ptolemy, um, who Ptolemy was a real pharaoh. This story is about uh, him rounding up all the Jews in Alexandria to kill them off, which... Uh, didn't really, I mean, it doesn't match up. There was a different Pharaoh who did do that. Um, he put them in the 
I forget the word. I learned the word just by reading about this story, but the like ancient racetrack, basically. He put the Jews in there and then let them be trampled by elephants, drunk mm -hmm. elephants. Um, in this in the story of the third Maccabees, it's a different, it's a, a fictionalized version of that story where the Pharaoh Ptolemy, Ptolemy um, sentences the Jews to die in the racetrack. God intervenes and saves them. And then Ptolemy is like, oh, God saved you. That must mean you're special people. So I'm going to listen to God now and we're all cool and everything's great between the Jews and the Egyptians now. And then, so then the saved Jews ask for permission to go slaughter the Jews that chose to convert rather than join them in the racetrack in the first place. And Ptolemy allows this. And that's how the story ends, is this bloody civil war amongst the Greek, the Hellenized Jews of Egypt. Uh, so you can kind of see the parallels, why it got this name, like why it got lumped in with the Maccabees, but doesn't have anything to do with the Maccabees, just has that name. Um, and then there's also a scroll of Antiochus, which uh, is very similar to the second book of Maccabees, the, the one that does mention God um, in the telling of the Hanukkah story. It's written much later. So whereas um, the first, second, and fourth Maccabees are written around... Um, the turn of the millennium. Um, I actually all four of them are. I just third Mac Maccabees is written in a different place, so it feels separate. But they're all written around between 100 BCE and 100 CE. Um, but then Megilla Antiochus isn't written until 200 CE, and it's written in Aramaic rather than Hebrew or Greek. So. I don't know. I mean, that to me is worth maybe worthy of a conversation. How is it that we have six books associated with the Hanukkah story or with the holiday of Hanukkah, and none of them made it into the canon? I don't have an answer, but like, it's, I think it's interesting. <laughs> Is it is it because it it uh, documents, so to speak, something that happened so much later than most of the history that got canonized that it was done already in people's minds, so they didn't want to add anything else, or I don't know. That's what I would have said before this project, because it is right the the Tanakh as we know it ends with Ezra and Nehemiah building the second temple. So everything of the second temple period feels like, well, sure, that's post-biblical. Why would it be in the Bible? But I, in reading this, I'm finding that so many of these works, like including the oldest known manuscripts of some of the biblical works were written in that time period. So... I guess because it is history and not like all those other things that were written down in the first century BCE were, you know, they were oral for 500 years before that. So like that gives it a different kind of weight, but I don't know, as long as you're transcribing things into Greek, like why not? Julia, you had your hand. What do you, yeah. I think that we forget that Hanukkah is really a very trivial holiday that's only been magnified because of its proximity to Christmas as being a Jewish Christmas. But if we don't think about it that way, and then it's really not important enough to be scripture, I don't think. Well, so I would agree with that too, except that I think part of it being such a minor holiday is because it's not scripture. 
but there are six books that in some way revolve around it. So I don't know. I mean, we've like, sure, Passover, Shavuot and Sukkot have like a lot of detail in the Torah itself. So like, I get that there's no way Hanukkah was ever gonna reach that level of prominence. But Esther's in the Bible. Purim is also a minor holiday, but her book is canonized and much likely far less historically accurate than first Maccabees or even second Maccabees for that matter. But it's so much more entertaining. It has all that sex in it. That's true, that's true. It does Maybe. mark a fairly critical historical event, though, doesn't it? Hanukkah? Critical in terms of importance. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe it was too long. It was six books, you said, which is longer than the Torah. And that would. That's true. How would you decide which of the six? Well, they could have condensed it, but not as much as they did. I would have picked just second Maccabees if I were canonizing it. Because it tells the story, but it does include uh, God. And then it's, you know, it's concise. So you, then you get it. It's fine. It's in there. Um, maybe Rabbi, I would oh, sorry, I'm no, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you go. I was going to say maybe I would also include a condensed version of the book of Judith up in uh, Judges. Like it doesn't have to be associated with Hanukkah. I think that also came later because of its non-scriptural role and that like it just came to be sort of lumped in with these other books that were written around the same time. But if it's a story that it claims to have taken place much earlier and perhaps was passed down orally earlier, I might include it with the other stories of its time. I don't know. What were you gonna say, Terry? <laughs> it was not very important and that truly I don't remember. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, I do remember. Is there any indication that at one time, very long ago, that Hanukkah was a more important festival? No. Okay. Um, some scholars believe, and this is not a far cry from, mm, which book? I forget now because I didn't put it in my summary. But one of the <laughs> one of the books of the Maccabees mentions um, a specific explanation of the Hanukkah celebration too. That seems to verify historians' belief that the celebration that came to be associated with Hanukkah was actually a belated Sukkot celebration that they. Okay were too busy fighting that, to, yes. to build their booths and have that eight day festival or week long festival. So they did it after the war was over. Okay, okay. So Thank it was, you. yeah. So it's always had a minor yeah. role. Something else I was going to say, and now I don't remember what, I don't remember which part of the conversation this was relevant to. <laughs> but another thing I noticed in um, reading about these books is that many of them um, 
I don't know, expand on the voice of the female characters of the Bible that we don't, or, or give us female characters that aren't in the Bible to begin with. Um, so for example, you know, we've got Judith. There's a chapter on um, a woman named Susanna in the, um, in the book of Daniel. Um, the, there are stories about um, the daughter of Jephthah, Jeph, Jephthah, I, uh, the guy who said, the next thing that comes out of my house, I will sacrifice if God will give me a military victory. And then his daughter comes out to greet him and um, get that story from the from judges and he has to sacrifice her. Hmm. There's a apocryphal story that's about like the, the, the Tanakh tells us and she goes up on the hill with her maidens and mourns and sings for a week. Um, but there's an apocryphal story that actually like tells about that week and records her prayer and things like that. So there's more, um, there's more women <laughs> in the Apocrypha than in the Tanakh, which I, um, I like, and I am, have my thoughts on why those stories did not make it into the Tanakh. But ironically, Esther, the expanded book of Esther does not really give Esther more anything. It includes bookends. It, it opens with a prophetic dream by Mordecai. And then like, I don't know, halfway through uh, the story, around the time that Esther learns about Haman's plot, there's another whole chapter about Mordecai interpreting his dream um, and like realizing what it all meant. So the male characters are actually the ones beefed up in that story instead of her or Vashti or, or anything else. Um, and, and those extra chapters in the book of Esther uh, in the Greek version um, do actually include God, which is like we talk about every year at firm is noticeably missing from our version of the book of Esther. Um, but the extra chapters in the Septuagint do include not only the vague mention of prayer and fasting, but like a direct supplication to God. And God's interference. Yeah, Debbie. Uh, speaking of women, I'm remembering a story from, you know, childhood Jewish stories about a woman I think her name was Hannah maybe, and she had 12 sons. And what I'm remembering about the story is they were, somebody was challenging their, asking them to bow down to somebody. And each son in turn refused and were killed in front of her eyes. Is that, from, is that apocryphal or is that a midrash from someplace else? Or do you know what that I'm talking about? That is a story in Maccabees. Um, okay. I think she kills them herself. I, Does she? I don't remember. On, let me... Maybe the children's version is different from the <laughs> adult version. Although um, we kept the story of Abraham and Isaac, so I don't know. Um, uh, no, you're right. They, she they, they were killed in front of her. It was, yeah, so it's part of the, sto of the story of the Maccabees. Um, they were commanded to, pro to prove their obedience to Antiochus, Antiochus by partaking of swine's flesh. They, def they refused to do so, and then they were all executed in front of their mother. Um, and then she died too. It doesn't say, was she murdered too? Uh, chapter seven, let's see. Here, can I share my screen or is my lack of video gonna make this hard? You can see that, right? Yes. Okay. 
All right, so this is Second Maccabees chapter seven, the story of Hannah. Her seven sons were imprisoned in jail. The king tortured them to make them eat pig meat and he beat them with rods and sticks. The firstborn said to him, what do you ask and what do you request from us? Behold, you will, you will strangulating us. That is weird grammar. Um, rather than turn us from the laws of our forefathers. Okay, so blah, 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 he kills them all. Um, I don't necessarily wanna read all of the tortures in great detail. Um, the fifth one, sixth one, she saw, saw her seven sons slaughtered before her eyes in one day. Oh no, the rest isn't translated. Okay. So she uh, believed in God and, and spoke, or she believed in her heart. Presumably she had faith in God, but then here I said, okay, so she spoke to God requesting strength. Um, and God said, oh, and said to God, I don't know the way, I don't know that word. Okay, so she asks for strength. So I guess Antiochus must kill her too because it looks like she doesn't exactly just keel over of a broken heart. She's still praying after all seven sons are killed. Yeah, this, this verse, Antiochus uh, was hard hearted because something um, and he did not care. So he took a rock and slaughtered her. Mm. So there you go. That's the story of Hannah. Again, another woman's story. Doesn't end well. That is, well, that's true. But to be fair, a lot of stories in the Maccabees don't end well. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately they win, but it's a war. A lot of people die. Yeah. But I guess the point was, it was a lesson in faith in God somehow. Right. Um, when I, again, it was a story that I remember from childhood, and it doesn't seem like the kind of story you would tell a child. But um, isn't that but true from so many children's stories, though? Yeah, yeah, I know. That's yeah, true. Stories. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, we just had. Uh, Parshat Noah, right? This is like the first story we teach to children. God destroyed the whole world and drowned everyone. Okay. Isaac wouldn't let me make gingerbread cookies with together because he was afraid the gingerbread man would come alive. Yeah, can't catch me on the gingerbread man. Right. Yeah. Got to be careful. Although I do have to say, I'm kind of glad that he uh, was afraid of the gingerbread cook man because so often I see children who hear that story and then read the gingerbread man and then like bite off his legs with relish, like, see you run <laughs> now. And uh, so I think that shows a deeper sense of empathy in eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll share that with his parents. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, uh, wait, go back. I How about the, yeah. the story of, of Masada? Is that in any of the Apocrypha or is that way too late? That is um, too late. Um, Pretty much all of the Apocrypha, all of the Jewish Apocrypha were finished by the destruction of the second temple. 
Mm -hmm. I think that was a pretty defining moment of um, by that point, uh, the canonization is pretty set. And then, um, so everything written after that is, everything recorded by, how do I say this? Like everything that we have kept as rabbinic Jews is recorded in the Talmud, in Midrash, in um, Josephus, you know, in the histories, things like that. So Masada, Bar Kokhba, um, those are kept in a, in a way as part of our non-scriptural stories, but this category of apocrypha, see that's kind of, it's a weird word, right? Because like it is by definition a category of exclusion. So then anything that's not in the Bible could be apocrypha, right? I could write a story tomorrow and say it's apocrypha, but but what they mean in this sense is stories that parallel in some way biblical text. Um, and so while midrash can continue forever, there's sort of like an end point at which anything written after, like the beginning of the rabbinic age is no longer apocrypha like that era has closed um but then of course you do still have like there's like i said there's um edits to some of these much later that then make it into the christian apocrypha there are like sequels <laughs> there are other books um ascribed to some of the same names um, like there's more books of the Esdras, for example, uh, that are written much later um, and are included in certain Christian, certain Christian canons and certain Christian apocrypha um, and things like that. So I think it has to do with the nearness to the canonization process. Their canonization extends later than ours, so their apocrypha does. Um, our, ours really ends um, with 70 CE, which Masada is around that time, right? Masada is what, 65? I mean, that's part of, it's part of that conquering, I think, right? Or is it part of Bar Kokhba? King Herod's palace. Uh, I thought that would be the prominent. Oh, okay, yeah, 73. There we go. I thought that story would be like the most important part of the you just Google Masada, that would be what comes up. But first they tell you, when was it built? Who was it for? Um, anyway, so yeah. Um, so I think for next time, maybe it makes sense to stick with one of the books that are available on Safaria, just to narrow it down because um, I trust Safaria's translation as much as, in as much as it exists, as we just saw from uh, <laughs> Maccabees, there are, might be some sections that haven't been fully translated, but um, let's start with that. So I think I'd like to talk about the book of Tobit to read and, and talk about. How do people feel about that? Just, it's, um, it's a, tells a story from the first temple period. So it's older than some of these other more historical ones. And it tells a story of Jews in Nineveh, which is like not a thing we hear about. 
much. You know, we think of the non-Jews of Nineveh that Jonah had to go and warn. Um, but there was also an early diaspora there. So um, let's, let's read that one and discuss it for next time. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thank week, you. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.